So let's now move to food testing, IgG food testing. Uh, and, and to speak to the, you know, but I removed my IgG sensitive foods and I feel better. This is another one of the really pernicious mistruths we have to be careful about. It's possible, like I said earlier, that you made healthy changes inspired by a lab result, but the lab result actually didn't tell you to do anything you couldn't have done otherwise, right? So in this case, if you had a food allergy test, as I did at one point, that came back with a bunch of things elevated, and then you improved your diet quality, you maybe reduce processed foods and reduce sugars, then you would see benefit due to those changes. But here are some of the data that underlies this. A 2022 study in the Journal of Frontiers Nutrition concluded, quote, IgG antibodies to wheat, dairy, and eggs were not different between healthy and symptomatic patients. So the antibodies in those who had symptoms and had no symptoms were the same. So how can this test be helpful if there's no difference between those who are ill, not feeling well, and those who are perfectly healthy? And one more similar data point, 2022, the Journal of Nutrition and Metabolism. Out of 28,000 healthy participants, 52 tested positive for IgG antibodies to various foods. In fact, uh, one of my friends, I, I won't name him, uh, but... Uh, very active on social media, incredibly fit and healthy guy. I mean, jealously so. Um, decided to do a food allergy test, and I believe it came back with 23 foods positive. And you know, the, the poor gentleman, I haven't had a chance to speak with him yet, but I would hate for him to get pulled into all sorts of dietary gymnastics due to the fact that he had these elevations because you see these elevations in normal populations. And if this gentleman who's at the pinnacle level of health and fitness is registering 23 food allergies, it tells us that this test does not have the ability to discriminate between those who have a problem and those who don't. It suffers from a high degree of false positives. And just one more quote to drive this home. The American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Quoting, IgG antibodies to common foods can be detected in health and disease. This reflects the likelihood that circulating antibodies to foods happen in most normal individuals. It was therefore concluded that food-specific IgG testing should not be used. And then the other reason why I am not an advocate for food allergy testing, and this was really where I came down, it does not tell you if you have a problem with FODMAPs, which we'll come back to in a moment, is one of the most supported dietary interventions for digestive symptoms. Histamine, which was something that was a real issue for me, causing brain fog, depression, and fatigue, and insomnia. And your carb tolerance. Some people don't do well on high carb. Some people actually do better on high carb. None of this is assessed with a food allergy test. So not only is it normal to see food antibodies in healthy people, the tests are also inaccurate, or because of that they're inaccurate, and they don't tell you about these other things that are quite important, especially, well, I mean, all these are important, but I, I would say in rank order, FODMAPs, and then second to that, the histamine and the carbohydrates. And of course, uh, you know, this, this always comes up, the allergy testing is expensive. You can find panels now that are over $1,000. And if you're going to do two or three of these over the course of changing your diet, that's $3,000 right there that you don't need to spend. And like we say at the clinic, your body is the boss. The alternative hypothesis here is to listen to the individual. You can learn so much. If someone comes in with fatigue, brain fog, and insomnia, and they've already been on a few diets and their diet is fairly restrictive, chances are they have learned their way into an overly avoidant diet and now they're either under eating or under eating carbs and going in the opposite direction may actually help them. Or conversely, perhaps someone is doing a somewhat ardent paleo diet and they're consuming lots of fermented foods and canned foods and jerkies and maybe avocado and spinach. I've called this a lazy man, uh, the lazy man's paleo. They may be overeating histamine. And so... Do we do $1,000 of blood work to not find the source of the problem? 
Or do we look at what they're eating? Do we look at their symptoms and make decisions based upon what their body is telling us? You know, I would advocate for the latter. And if that alone is not enough, some studies looking at the response rate to or the improvement rate from food allergy testing guided diets as compared to the low FODMAP diet have clocked in at the allergy testing gives you a 10 to 48% chance of improvement, whereas low FODMAP clocks in at a 50 to 80% level of improvement. Now, not only should that hopefully sway one's thinking on this, but also one of these studies had very, very poor methodology that we reviewed on the podcast maybe two years ago. Uh, shout out to Dr. Robert Abbott, who him and I went through and kind of uh, picked through this study together. So this is even charitable, but okay, playing devil's advocate, looking at the numbers, a 10 to 48% response rate for food allergy testing guided diets, and the low FODMAP diet comes in at 50 to 80% of improvement. So we can clearly see that a low FODMAP diet does better than a food allergy testing guided diet, and it's going to be far less expensive, maybe $1,000 less because the low FODMAP diet is essentially free. You don't need to pay for a test in order to do that. So silence the testing, listen to your body, and one place to start could be low FODMAP. Mm -hmm.